Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Tape Trader's Guide to 90s Pro Wrestling. I am your host, J.D. Sloan. Uh, my co-host, Johnny Bandani, Bandana, unfortunately is not here today, so I'm going at this alone. Um, so today we are going to discuss the main event of the FMW 6th anniversary on 5-5-1995. Onita versus Hayabusa in a barbed wire steel cage, time bomb, electrified um, death match. It, it's it's a wild, wild match. Um, so uh, let's start off with a few plugs real quick. Um, I want to plug the Patreon page for this podcast. It is patreon.com forward slash, slash WrestleTopia TV. You know, you can become a patron for as low as $2 a month and as high as $10 a month. Any any help, uh, any support from anyone out there would be much, much appreciative. Um, so we can pay for this podcast and, you know, hopefully buy new equipment, upgrade, do more podcasts, different things like that, pay guests. You know, make this bigger, better, uh, and more successful. Also, make sure you check out my YouTube page. Just search WrestleTopia TV. And do not forget to check out the Facebook page. Uh, it is facebook.com forward slash 90s Indie Podcast. Uh, push the like button on that. Make sure you share, um, you know, communicate, leave messages. Let us know what you like us to talk about, what you remember from the 90s, uh, things that maybe you heard about that you've never seen or or whatever, we want to make this as completely interactive as we possibly can with everybody that enjoys uh, that that not not just '90s wrestling because it's not this isn't just about the '90s wrestling, but it's much more about that subculture of the tape trading world. Um, whether you know whether you traded DVDs or you traded VHS or or you know whatever trading Google Drive links, whatever it is, um, there is a a culture behind that that you know. I was it, it was very important to me in my childhood, and so if you're like-minded and you know other like-minded people, you know make sure you put that word out. Let everybody know the only way we can grow is with support and help from you know awesome, wonderful fans like you. And you know, and the only way we can get better is if you let us know the things that you want to hear about and the things that you want to listen to. So uh, you know, please check out all the social media and. Uh, and communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, also, if you're listening to this any place other than Podbean, please check out the bo- the please uh, subscribe and download the Podbean app and uh, check us out. 90s Tape Traders Guide to 90s uh, Pro Wrestling and hit the subscribe button. Uh, every subscribe just makes us more and more powerful. Um, so let's get on to it. So today we're going to do the FMW sixth anniversary. And this was one of those tapes that, uh, this was actually the very first FMW tape that I ever saw as a kid. Um, I probably got this either really late 1995 or perhaps really early 96. I had already watched some Japanese deathmatch wrestling by this time. I had already gotten the, the IWA King of Deathmatch, which is probably, you know, in the, not only back then but even to this day you know with the clips of it being shown on wwe tv and and so many pictures t- shown and you know catch jack talking about it and everything i mean you know that was probably one of those those tapes that just everybody had you know we everybody that did tape trading had that tape so i'd already seen that um and i'd also seen one or two wing uh tapes um, that was, you know, these were 1993 events, maybe 1994. So I was fairly familiar with Japanese deathmatch wrestling, but I wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that I was really, really deep into. Um, so I, I kind of knew what little to expect when I saw the listings, when I saw that it was a deathmatch and that, you know, it, the barbed wire cage and the time bomb and everything. I just figured, oh, this is going to be some crazy shit that I'm going to see. And this is going to be a lot of fun. Because that's how I viewed Deathmatch Wrestling. You know, it was one of those things. And even to this day, I mean, I, I'll, I can turn it on. And I may not be what I would call, you know, a giant fan of Deathmatch Wrestling. I'm not a defend Deathmatch Wrestling guy. But I definitely think it has its place. And it's it can be enjoyable to watch in a, in a perversely destructive and, and, and sick kind of way, you know, I mean, this is all a work, you know, let's all keep this in mind, 
And so it, it can be one of those things where it can be slightly enjoyable from time to time. And when you're a teenager like I was, you know, being 15, 16 years old, it was even that much cooler. And so I, I knew what it was. I wasn't a giant fan. And so when I'm reading the listings, I didn't really know who like Onita was. And some of the other guys on the, some of the other people on the show, I didn't necessarily know who they were because it wasn't Terry Funk and it wasn't, uh, Cactus Jack and it wasn't Sabu. Uh, so I didn't know who everyone was. But one of the main reasons why I got this tape, and I'll never forget this because the pictures of Hayabusa, I always thought Hayabusa was Sabu under a mask. And I thought that the, the scarring on his on his torso and arms, they looked familiar to what Sabu looked like. The pants, you know, were the same. The long, dark hair. And so I just figured this is this is all, you know, this is Sabu under a mask. And, and that's really honestly what I really thought. So I get the tape. And I'm not going to do, you know, I'm not Conrad Thompson. And, and this isn't something to wrestle with. And, and I'm also... Um, I'm not going to do a full-on recap move for move of every single match and every little thing that happens. Um, but I am going to do kind of a quick synopsis of, of what I remember. And, and of course, you know, if, you, if you've been following the Facebook page, you know, I've posted the whole event. And then I've also posted just the, the main event, which is what I'm going to focus on the most. Um, so I've watched it very recently. I've, you know, I, over the, the last couple of weeks, I've watched it multiple times. Um so some of the things that I remember the most about when I very first got the tape was the pageantry of FMW. It was completely different than IWA. It was completely different than Wing, which, you know, Wing was always very, um, I would say, the C-rated uh, of the indies. And that's not even to be disrespectful or anything. I just mean when you watched Wing, it was very different. There was – they didn't have uh, – they didn't spend money on lighting or, uh, you know, crazy music. The, the ring didn't look – exactly the best or anything they wing had a lot of really good talent um really in all inceptions of ring of wing that there was really good talent but it wasn't the same and even iwa japan you know the the shows outside of that king of death match were kind of on the the indirific kind of way which I love indie, you know, I love indie more than I love mainstream, and so it was always fine. But when I saw FMW for the first time on this this event particularly, I was amazed that this was the WWE of deathmatch wrestling. They they had a, a big arena and a ton of fans, and it was loud, and they had all kinds of of you know good good lights were, were used, and 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 I just remember how dramatic. Everything was with FMW, and Onita especially is probably the king of of drama when it comes to death metal death match wrestling. And when I first started watching this and stuff, you know, of course, this was the early days of me learning the computer and everything like that. But obviously, after this, I, I started watching a lot of FMW and getting a lot of FMW tapes and learning about Onita and how he came to Memphis and and. And, you know, when he was a young boy, he was working all Japan and things like that. But when he took his his uh, tours and he would go to Puerto Rico and go to Memphis and he was wrestling Abdullah the Butcher and then going to Memphis and wrestling the Memphis style. And, you know, that really uh, inspired him with this brawling, crazy, dramatic, emotional style that really sets him apart and, and FMW in general. Apart from what I consider to be, you know, and I'm going to quote unquote garbage wrestling because it was it was referred to that a lot when I was a tape trader. It was referred to as garbage wrestling. Whether you agree with that term or not, you know, that's just that's honestly what it was called. wasn't There wasn't as large of a, of a, a community, I guess, that brought people together on deathmatch wrestling. Um, I think it started to expand a lot more as the 90s went on. And, and in the U.S., you know, Ian Rotten opened up IWA Mid-South. Uh, Mid and, uh, and and then, you know, as the 90s grew and grew. Because there was other, other promotions. And, you know, ECW is always talked about as being this extreme, you know, all they do is brawl and bleed, and which it wasn't. It, it, it just, it really, really wasn't. And I, and I hate for people... Not only to refer to it that way, to be believe that that's what it was. Because ECW, 
and, and I'm a I'm a big fan of ECW. ECW a lot of times, and not all the time. Sometimes they put on some shit shows and had some shit matches, and, and and everyone does. But for the most part, they were a very well rounded organization. You know, they had extremely talented in ring performances every every show, and and they they mix that with these hardcore brawls where people hit each other with stop signs and, and, you know, use a sledgehammer on a pair of nuts. Um, it was interwoven together and, and they had the high spot match and they had the, the nasty, dirty women's cat fight and they had all these things and they were all rolled into one show. So they weren't a death match company at all. And they weren't even just a brawl for all kind of company. They were a well-rounded organization that kind of had a little bit of everything. Um, which isn't what garbage wrestling really is. And, and even Ian Rotten, you know, had a lot of incredible talent. But I consider, you know, especially the early days of Ian's shows. And, I, and I've been to a couple in, when he a long time ago when he was still running in Kentucky. Um, and they were kind of, you know, they, they were they were a, a fun indie show to go to when you're 17, 16 years old. Um, but they weren't. They weren't top notch in, in building and ring and you know all those things that some people want to see when they go to an event. It was a little bit. It was extra indie. It was uh, it was super underground. But FMW was really not that way. They were a large promotion, and for a very long time they were a large promotion. And one of the great things, and I learned about all these things later as I got into FMW. But one of the great things about this FMW five five ninety five event. The sixth anniversary event was this was a, a year long story arc of Onita and his retirement tour. The year before, at the fifth anniversary, he had lost a retirement match to Tenru. And after this match actually took place, after he lost the, the fall, it was announced that Onita would be going on a year long retirement tour. So he 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 lost the match to Tenru. Um, to be retired, but he wasn't actually going to retire after that match. He was instead going to go on an entire year-long tour, which is funny because I believe this is either his third or fourth retirement at this time in 1995. Um, I believe he started wrestling in 1976 or 77, and his first retirement was in 85. And So I believe at this point he's already hit three or four retirements. Um, but he goes on this year-long tour, and, and over this year-long tour, he lands up losing a match to Mr. Pogo and losing the title, the uh, Brass Nux title. And they had kind of made the decision that he was going to work ten, uh, – um, oh, what was his name? Uh, Tarzan Gatu. He was going to work Tarzan Gatu to be – for the retirement match at this show, at the sixth anniversary show. And – I don't know exactly what happened other than Tarzan, who, who you know, Tarzan was a guy who I've seen multiple times. And the first time I saw him, I think, was in ECW against Axel Rotten when he bent that chair over the back of Axel. And he was never what I would call I – can't, I, I can't see how Onita versus Tarzan. And again, you know, I'm not from Japan, and I, I certainly wasn't living there at the time, and I, I wasn't a – I'm not a, a Japanese historian in Japanese wrestling. So maybe he was a, a perfectly fine draw, but I could never see him as one. Um, I never thought that he looked the part. I never thought that he necessarily worked the part. But for whatever the reason was, the, the idea was to go Tarzan and Onita for Onita's retirement at this event, and it landed up falling apart. And after it fell apart, they went to Mr. Pogo and asked Mr. Pogo to do it. And at the the absolute offense um, to Mr. Pogo, because he felt like he wasn't a substitute. He wasn't the second fiddle. He wasn't second best. There's no reason for them to come and ask him after Tarzan had already dropped out for whatever the reason was. So Mr. Pogo, who, who I think was probably you know Onita's greatest challenger... Um, decided to not take him up on this match. And so at this point, there's two people down, and Onita still doesn't have that opponent to, to bring him into his retirement. So they decide to go with... Um, oh, who was it? They were going to go to... I believe someone named Takahishi Ishikawa. 
but the FMW audience didn't feel like he was a main eventer. And because of this, they, they got cold feet, and they decided to not go with this. I hope I said his name correctly, but they decided to not go with him. And that's when they made the decision to, to go with Hayabusa. Now, Hayabusa, at, at the time, I believe was already deep into this gimmick and everything. Uh, he had already gotten back from his CMLL tour, and he was an underneath guy in the beginning when he was going under his name as e- Elijah Izaki. Um, I just butchered that name. I only know him as Hayabusa. But I know that at the time, he was just an underneath guy, and he was deep into this gimmick. And so I don't know if it was the fans or if it was Onita who saw him as this, this next coming. Um, I, like I said, he's the one that brought me into FMW. It was it was Hayabusa. I think Hayabusa is one of the most underrated people in the business, simply because I don't think he got the proper... Um, people didn't know about him in the United States the way that they really should have. He was a Sabu. He was an innovator. He was someone that had a completely different look. He's someone that worked completely different. He was uh, high energy, exciting, um, flamboyant, colorful. I, if, if he would have been a, an ECW regular, a WCW regular, a WWE regular, he would have gotten over huge here in the States. I really, really believe that. So going into this match, you had Onita, the, the guy that created FMW, the old guard, and here it is, his retirement, and he's, he's going up against Hayabusa, the, the new lion, so to speak, um, the guy that's got to take FMW into the next year, into, you know, the seventh anniversary, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, and, you know, while we're on the subject, this is actually Onita's last main event in, at an anniversary show. Although he, the retirement didn't last, I believe it lasted a year. Um, even though the retirement didn't last, he, this, this was the last main event that he did for FMW. And unfortunately, FMW, after this, this was the largest FMW show that they had ever promoted. And they were never able to reach this kind of height in popularity and financial success again. Unfortunately, and they land up going out of business in, I believe, 2001 or 2002. Um, fortunately, they have made a return. That They've actually made two returns. Uh, I believe they, they returned in 2000. Uh, I can't remember what it is. I should probably look that up. Uh, I'm not sure if they, they returned in 2012. Um, but they came back in 2015, and I believe they still run shows uh, uh, sporadically to this day um but now going into this match you know i get the tape and i and i'm reading the (laughs) i'm reading the the listings for the tape and this the main event is a no rope exploding barbed wire death match for the fmw brass knuckles heavyweight championship and i'm thinking what in the hell is a no rope exploding barbed wire death match, you know? And I didn't know that it was in a cage. I didn't know that there was a time bomb on it that after a certain amount of time the the outside of the ring bombs were going to go off and every time that a, uh, an opponent hit the barbed wire sparks shot everywhere because it was electrified barbed wire and you know this was just for for a 14 year uh, 1995 so for a uh, uh, 14 and a half 15 year old this was freaking amazing it was it was outrageous if if, to say the least um i had never seen anything like it it was wild it was crazy it was bloody but it was not grotesque at all hayabusa and onita worked a absolutely stunning and beautiful match full of psychology and story and Almost to the point where it's it's so hard to believe that they were even able to do that within the structure of this barbed wire exploding time bomb match. Um, it didn't even make sense for such a good match to come out of something like that because it really was masterful. Um, unfortunately, and, and I, you know, I don't know if this was just Onita's power stroke in him not losing the Hayabusa and I don't know maybe you know perhaps the simple fact that he didn't lose the Hayabusa in this match was one of the reasons why Hayabusa was never able to draw the kind of money that that this event drew um or you know it could just possibly be that the Japanese fans truly believe that this was going to be Onita's last match and and they truly believe that this was a retirement whatever the reason was 
Onita landed up going over on Hayabusa. And I never quite understood that, especially as a kid. Um, you know, I, I, I saw Hayabusa and I wanted Hayabusa to win because he was flashy, he was flamboyant, he was colorful. All those things I said before, the mask, everything. But I, I'll never forget after the match was over and, and after that last powerbomb that... And the power bombs were, were devastating the, the entire match. After the last power bomb given to Hayabusa and the pageantry that was going on in the ring with the, the pouring the water on the opponent and and all of the the other wrestlers rushing to the crowd and you know helping the wrestlers to the, the mat and Onita just walking around the ring staring at people and you know shouting uh, <laughs> uh, ridiculously and then you know the 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 tape brings you to the backstage, and they they go into the the locker room, and you see Hayabusa laying on the on the ground with his ma- mask ripped off, and he's crying. And then you see Onita standing above him, and you know Onita's crying and, and talking to Hayabusa and telling him that you know the FMW is his now, and that it is it's up to him to go on and to you know bring it to greatness, and you know all the great. Things that the Japanese culture intertwines into their sports and the respect and the, you know, all that. It was so incredible to me. And it was just, it was, it is one of those shows that if you've never seen this event, you've got to go out of your way to look it up. It's all over YouTube. And, you know, whether you want to watch just this match or the entire event, it's it's all over the place. And it's something that definitely needs to be viewed and appreciated for what it is because, you know, it is one of those things. It shouldn't have been as – that match shouldn't have been as good as it was. Uh, you know, a barbed wire, uh, time bomb, all of FMW's main events, you know, all of their big – shows were good they were they were all good uh, some better than others but they were all very enjoyable events from top to bottom even the undercard on this show you know was was great you have uh tanaka masa 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 masato tanaka um a former fmw champion um at this time he was yet to be that but he he and uh a tag team partner wrestled Horace Boulder and the Gladiator, Mike Awesome. So you have Hogan's cousin and Mike Awesome as a tag team going up against Tanaka and a, and a, and a tag team partner in just a wild brawl that went all over the crowd. And that was not the best match of the night, but it was a lot of fun to watch. And, you know, if you got Tanaka and Mike Awesome in a match, that's aces all the way around. Um, Megumi Kudo, she defeated Bad Nurse Nakamura. Which was a fantastic women's match. And FMW always had really great, hard-hitting, probably some of the toughest, meanest shit I've ever seen in my entire life is Japanese women's wrestling. Just absolute fucking incredible when it comes to stiffness. Just, I've never seen anything like it. And in the 90s, they were full force going 100 miles an hour and beating the shit out of each other nonstop. Whether it was All Japan Women, Gira. Um, or FMW, it, they always were kicking ass. And this match especially was an absolutely incredible match to watch. Um, and then, like, you know, you had a, a, a under two-minute match with the Sheik taking on Damien 666. And, you know, so it just, the, the, the events were just, they were good. They were really enjoyable. And for a young kid that's tape trading and learning about all these different wrestling companies and all these different wrestling styles and different people and, 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 and wrestlers and all this stuff, you know, this was just one of those crazy fucking shows that I, you couldn't get out of your head. And then you had to get more. You know, you had to get past FMW stuff and new FMW stuff. And honestly, FMW, more than anything, probably created my interest in Japanese wrestling. And I've always preferred New Japan, to be honest. Um, you know, I loved All Japan 1993, All Japan 95, 97, 98. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of FMW. I like all of FMW. Um, but honestly, you know, New Japan is probably my favorite, but it was FMW that just gave me the desire to learn about Japanese pro wrestling just because it was so different and so hard hitting and, uh, so dramatic, you know, Japanese culture, especially in professional wrestling is so serious. Even, you know, you, you turn on New, all J- or New Japan now and you see a lot of comedy stuff, especially with the Bullet Club and, 
you know, there's this new thing of, you know, talking shit to the fans and, you know, uh, Japanese wrestling has, has progressed and changed and, and evolved just like anything else has, but there's still a certain kind of respect and importance in, in what being a professional wrestler is in Japan. And it, it's, it's so, it's so re- refreshing sometimes to be able to watch, you know, people respect the business again like it like it once was so i thank fmw for that um i thank some of the the crazy spots that they that they did and you know unfortunately hayabusa in later years was paralyzed from from honestly you know not necessarily a not a low risk move but not a high risk move doing a springboard uh moonsault um off the middle rope and unfortunately didn't rotate all the way and landed directly on the 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 tip of his head and broke his neck and was paralyzed for many years and you know right before he passed away he was he had just recently walked to the the ring where he got into the ring on his own um but he was never able to wrestle again and you know it was really unfortunate that he was never able to get the due that he deserves from the the wider global audience of of wrestling fans because he was truly innovative and definitely an important part in in professional wrestling um onita like i said you know just recently retired um this one more than likely will be the final one (laughs) um i i he at his age i can't see him uh you never know dory funk jr is still working matches so perhaps onita will come out of retirement again but unfortunately, FMW, you know, what it once was, went away. Um, they had some other really wild and crazy matches. They had a the pool death match, which, if memory serves me right, it was Mike Awesome and Terry Funk taking on um, Tanaka. And I can't remember. Now i got to look it up. I can't remember who it was, um, but that is a wild... Uh, a wild event where they wrestle in in a middle of I, I don't know if it's a lake or if it's just a giant pool, um, but they they set up a ring and it's got um, ropes on just opposite sides of each other, and then on the other sides of the ring there's no ropes at all. And when you get thrown into the water, <laughs> there would be um, explosions going off, and it was a uh, it was quite the the thing to see. Let's see. I just let me see if I can find the participants in this match because this was another one of those matches that you know it's hard to forget. Um, oh, at the show there was also Sabu versus the Hayabusa, which was the first time I truly because you know even after I learned that Hayabusa and Sabu weren't real until I saw the two of them wrestle against each other for the first time, I never really was for sure. You know, I was never one hundred percent sure they weren't the same person, but. Um, Let's see the the elect. It was it was called a barbed wire electrified dynamite pool double hell death match, and it was Onita Naima and Mr. Ganasuka versus Mr. Pogo the Gladiator and Hosaka, and that was an absolutely ridiculous ridiculous match. <laughs> but uh, some of the other you know people to come out of FMW there was Horace Hogan, which you know later went on to WCW and joined the NWO and is Hulk Hogan's nephew, I believe. Um, Mike Awesome was there, uh, Sabu wrestled for FMW, the Sheik, Sabu's, uh, the original Sheik, Sabu's uncle, wrestled for FMW, Big Titan, which would later go on to become the fake Razor Ramon in the WWE, uh, you know, got his notoriety, so to speak, in FMW, um, Combat Toyota, uh, a definitely a female t- for everyone to go and look up and Watch as much Combat Toyota as you can on YouTube because she was one mean, one mean chick. <laughs> um, who are some other notable people? Uh, Ricky Fuji was there. Great Sasaki, uh, which, you know, the person that created Michinoku Pro. He was also uh, one of the people to kind of start the WWE light heavyweight title. It, him and uh, he was, he wrestled. Taka Michinoku um, at the f- uh, 1998 pay-per-view, I think. And they happened to like Taka Michinoku so much they gave him a contract and not, missed, not a great Sasuke. 
But uh, Great Sasuke, who is a high flyer, not a deathmatch wrestler, has had a barbed wire exploding time bomb deathmatch with Onita, which I think everyone has. Tenru, um, I can't think of... Uh, everyone has had one of these matches with, with Onita at this point. Uh, but it was, you know, it's a really good, really fun company. They always had a mixture of, of a few Americans and maybe a Mexican guy here and there from CMLL. Um, but I highly recommend if you ever get a chance, you know, look up FMW if you're not a fan of theirs, you know, check out some of their their stuff and, you know, see what you don't, you know, you never know. You know, it might be up your alley. Maybe it's not. Pro wrestling is completely subjective. Everyone's allowed to like what they like and who they like and the way they like it. You know, if you can't get out of 1983 Memphis, then by God, you should only watch 1983 Memphis. You know, that is okay. As long as you like pro wrestling, as long as you love it, you know, by all means, enjoy what you enjoy and don't worry about the other stuff, you know. So uh, one of the other things that we were going to talk about was going to be WCW 1990. Um, you know, I really wanted to talk about this with Johnny. I'm, I'm, I'm sad that he was unable to make it today, and this podcast would have been, you know, five times better with, uh, with my homie Bandana sitting right next to me. But one of the reasons why I wanted, to, wanted Bandana to be my, my co-host on, on every episode, you know, or as many episodes as he's able to... Um, you know, the reason why he wasn't here last week was because he was, you know, off in in Orlando doing his thing and making that money. But, you know, for whenever he's available, I want to make sure he's here because Bandana came he, – he, he became a wrestling fan in a completely different time period. And it wasn't from – D wasn't from VHS tape trading that made him a fan. You know, I'm a guy that watched wrestling and knew about it. But didn't really pay that much attention to it and wasn't really necessarily much of a fan. And it was through chance that, you know, I became a tape trader. And the tape trading really sucked me in. And the the search for knowledge on the product and the business um, kind of just became an obsession, you know. And, and so I wanted to learn everything i could about wrestling and i wanted to get tapes from every single wrestling promotion on the planet from every time period there ever was and and you know and so that's what really sparked my interest and that's how i learned a lot of stuff you know and you know i became a wrestling fan you know for all intents purposes in in 1992 but you know, getting tapes from WCW in the, you know, 1990 and 1980s and, you know, all this stuff was so important to me and it helped me really understand and learn where the business came from and how it got to where it got to. And so, you know, as the, you know, WCW 1990 was it was an odd and, and strange time, as wrestling Kind of, you know, it became this huge thing, and and you know, I know that it was very popular in the fifties, and it kind of turned a, took a down spell, and kind of popped back up in the seventies, you know, and it kind of take another down spell, like like wrestling has, like we all know that it's that it does, and you know, nineteen eighty five, nineteen eighty six, nineteen eighty seven, you know, wrestling is just hot. It's just it's big business all over the place, and for all the different promotions that are running, and and you know, we got to remember there wasn't. There wasn't necessarily that same kind of territory system in 85, 86, 87, but there were still territories. And so, you know, Pensacola, Florida was making a ton of money, and Alabama was making money, and uh, Nevada was making money, and all these different places were making money, including Vince, and including Jim Crockett Promotions, and Bill Watts, and Stu Hart, and, you know, these places were making a lot of money, and everyone was traveling everywhere, and wrestlers were these big rock stars. And then 1988 happened, and that was kind of the start of of just the the downward swing. And you had Bill Watts decide to get out of the business and over overestimated or you know oversold or whatever, um, his company and his territory to uh, Jim Crockett. And unfortunately, Jim Crockett bit, and he he spent a whole lot of money for something that would have gone out of business one way or another. That he could have just gone in and just taken over the territory after Bill Watts stopped running. It was honestly that, you know, to, to my understanding, I don't, I don't know this firsthand, but Bill Watts was going to get out of the game. He, he was not going to lose any money to run professional wrestling. And, 
Mid-South was starting to lose money. So this was it. And he didn't have to he, – he sold a company that didn't have to be purchased. And unfortunately, Jim Crockett was the one that bought it. And he spent a lot of money on something that all he did was kill off the talent that came from Mid-South anyways. So he purchased a bunch of talent that didn't get a return on for a territory that wasn't drawing any, any money in the first place. So, unfortunately, 88, 89, 90, things were not looking great. And then as we get into the beginning of the 90s, um, you know, we start seeing this influx of, uh, of I guess what they'd be, they'd be called outlaw promotions in, in the territory days. But a lot of these were very different than outlaw promotions. Because, um, you know, even today, you know, we have indies and then we have what, what I like to call the indirific. The indie-rific kind of promotions. The ones that are, I would still consider outlaw promotions. They're just, you know, a lot of untrained guys working in a poor ring in a bad building in front of their friends and family for absolutely nothing. Putting on shit shows um, that shouldn't be going on in the first place. And, and they're still out there. And those are still outlaw promotions in my, in my opinion. But the 90s saw indie wrestling kind of created kind of start up you know in the early days you had these promotions you know and a lot of them came out of deals with you know one one promoter and another or um guys buying up you know tv time and different things like that you know you had the kind of creation of the uswa out of you know both texas and the cwa in memphis you know, the USWA kind of was created, uh, Jarrett wanted to create a national company. And he felt like the name and brand, the U United States Wrestling Association, was a national brand. And he wanted to run all of Texas and, and run all of, of, of Tennessee and, and be able to shoot his TV so that the whole country is getting, you know, USWA product. You had the IWCCW that came on a little bit later. I believe it was late 91, early 1992, um, which was also, you know, the Savaldis were looking to expand um, and, and create something a, a bigger and more national. And so they hooked up with the Von Erichs, who still retained the name World Class. And they, you know, from um, ICW came IWCCW, which was International World Class Championship Wrestling. And they, they, again, you know, they, they had shows in, from Hawaii to, um, I don't know if they ever actually worked anything in Texas, uh, but the Northeast. And, um, you know, so you had a lot of these, you know, the TWA, Joel Goodhart's TWA. Um, you had Dennis Car Caruso and his North, you know, everything he was doing in the Northeast. And then WCW was purchased by Ted Turner. And so a lot of things started to happen. First, they wanted to kind of get away from that NWA branding. Um, I know the, I believe it was 91 is when the official, I believe 91 is when the official split happened. Um, I could be wrong about that, you know, especially with, with my, I, I'm getting older and I don't retain all the knowledge in the world. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Turner comes in, they purchase WCW, they bring in a lot of different people that are outside of wrestling to run this wrestling company, and a lot of different things happen. And so one of the things I want to do right now is I want to talk about uh, some of – because I, I love early 90s WCW. Early 90s WCW is fun and for many different reasons, kind of the same reason the FMW is fun. You know, they had a, a great deal of, of highly talented performers. Um, working for them at all times, WCW has always, you know, had a lot of great performers, and then they also had a lot of like some some of these guys. You just can't, you know, how how in the world did these guys get on national TV? <laughs> you know what I'm saying like how is how were they able to talk their way into this? Um, and they did a lot of a lot of weird things. Like I noticed, if you notice on their the WCW pay per views, especially 1990, 1991, um, even 1992, there are so many announcers, so many commentators, so many ringside interviewers, so many backstage interviewers. You know, a single pay per view has two people on the floor, two people you know up high, three people backstage interviewing. Um, a couple people walking, you know, performers out to the ring. It's just ridiculous. There's so many 
um, you know, from Gordon Soul, you know, sometimes I, some pay per views would have Jim Ross, Tony Schiavone, Gordon Soley, um, as Jesse Ventura, Missy Hyatt, Eric Bischoff, uh, you know, maybe Johnny B. Bad. Literally, there would be literally this many people doing commentary and announcing for one single pay per view. It was just crazy. So in 1990, the WCW, NWA, it was still NWA, the, the roster total was 41 people. Um, and that's in January of 1990. By uh, December of 1990, it was down to 36 performers. And this is, this is contracted people. Of course, people come and go and you know, work on per night appearances. But what's so crazy is, you know, if you look, and I've, I've got it in front of me, I've got the you know, month by month the breakdown of who was under contract and the number of contracted people. And it's kind of crazy the fluctuation of 1990 because you start out with 41, you go down to 37 in February. Uh, March, there's still 37. In April, they bump it up to 39. In in May, they bump it up to 41. Um, June, 43. July, 41. August, 38. September, 39. Um, and then October and November, they have 44 and 42 respectively, and then they do- they drop all the way down to 36 in December, which is just crazy to me. Um, it's crazy that there's so many ups and downs with the number of talent that they had in a single year. But just, you know, off the top of some of the talent they had in WCW in the 90s were, were, was great. You know, I mean, they had the great Muda was on the roster, um, you know, Sting, uh, Arn Anderson, Cactus Jack, Buzz Sawyer, Bam Bam Bigelow was a, a NWA performer at this time. Um, and then some of the people they had were just so bad. Dragon Master. Um, who remembers Dragon Master in WCW? This guy was not my favorite performer, especially in an American ring. <laughs> you know, he was just not um, what I would call the number one performer. Um, I believe there was a clash of champions where him and the Dragon Master, perhaps Buzz Sawyer, and the Great Muda took on Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, and oh, who in a steel cage on Clash of Champions, and it was absolutely awful, just so terrible. I, I just think uh, he perhaps, I don't know what to think. It was bad stuff. Um, but WCW in the 90s was one of my favorite promotions. Definitely something uh, that's fun to go look back on, to look to watch the PN News, to watch uh, Axel Rotten in WCW, Robbie V., Later went on to Rob Van Dam. You know, all these things um, was absolutely fantastic. So, um, like I said, you know, I am sorry that you guys had to power through this 45-minute long podcast today with just me talking. Um, Hopefully, Bandana can be here next week and we can come up with a great event that I'll, you know, I'll promote this on, you know, my Patreon page. I'll promote it on the Facebook page. I'll promote it everywhere I can on the next uh, event that we plan on reviewing. Uh, this time we'll do an actual review, you know, like I said, I, a, a formatted podcast. Um, unfortunately, I found out pretty late that Bandana wasn't going to be here. And so I figured, you know, let me just hit the record button, sit here and bullshit for a little while. And hopefully it can be somewhat entertaining. If it's not, I'm sorry about that. I appreciate you guys all sticking through this if you're still listening at this point. Um, so I appreciate it if you are. Um, if not, you know, please send me a message. Let me know what, what do you want me to talk about. Do you want let's, let's talk about IWCCW. Do you want to talk about some Smoky Mountain Wrestling? Do you want to talk about uh, AWF and the, the, the wrestling company that had the rounds? Um, what are some other – I mean, you know, what do you – global. Do you want to talk about some global stuff, the global light heavyweight tournament? Um, you know, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to hear? Let me know, and we're going to make it happen. Some future guests that I have coming on is going to be uh, Francisco Kiatsu. Um, Jerry Lynn will, will be a, a future guest. Um, we're going to have some recurring 
guests that will be here, you know, from time to time, maybe once a month, once every couple of months. Um, guys like Quentin Charisma, he's going to come on and we're going to talk Tennessee pro wrestling. Um, Steve Hall, um, one of my, my trainers personally. Um, but a, a great guy to see, you know, he's got great stories of, you know, Mr. Perfect and Steve Dahl and Reno Riggins. Um, great, great stories. Um, I've also got, you know, I reached out to Izzy High, who is a former IWA Mid South um, competitor. Uh, you probably know him as American Kickboxer um, in the 90s. So, you know, I reached out to him, talked to him, and we're going to have him on sometime soon. Um, James Carver, the owner, operator, promoter, what have you, of AWA New South in Franklin, Kentucky. We're going to have him stop by and sit down and bullshit and talk. LT Falk, we're going to have him come back by. You know, we got all the way up to, I believe, um, USWO going from Madison to downtown Nashville. So we still have, you know, 10 years worth of, of, of stuff to talk about that we didn't even scratch the surface with. So, you know, LT will be back real soon. Um, Ryan Rogan, my buddy, the Vagabond, who's currently tearing it up, uh, Lucha Libre style in Mexico right now. Um, we're going to have him call in and talk to him and lots and lots of other people. You know, the main goal is, is honestly to just have these, let's just tell stories. Let's talk about great times. Let's remember what wrestling was at one time, what we enjoyed about it. If, if, if you weren't a, a viewer back in the nineties, well, let's, let's inspire you a little bit. Let's, let's get you to go back there and watch some different things that maybe you've never seen before. Maybe you've never heard before. Or even if you were a viewer in the nineties, you know, maybe you've never heard of IWCCW or maybe you've never heard of the AWF or, or whatever. And, and by talking about it and, and telling, you know, stories about it and stuff, it, it, it sparks an interest and it, and it creates an, an, uh, an idea in your head to go back and find this stuff on YouTube or find people selling DVDs or whatever it might be. Um, because that's what, you know, pro wrestling is all about, man. It's all about being, you know, part of a community and being a, a, a brotherhood and a family of, of fans and, 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 you know, the, the passion of the business, you know, that we all hold, you know, near and dear. So, you know, I want this podcast to be, you know, enjoyable to everybody. Not, you know, I want it to be fun for me to do and, you know, have a good time and everything. But I want you, the, the listener, to really enjoy it and, and let me know what it is you want to hear and what kind of stuff you want to talk about. And do you guys want to get, come on the line? You know, call, let's, let's have you come on. Let's have you leave messages. Have you talk about different things that you want to talk about and, you know, tell me what it is you want to hear and, Let's let's you know we can have a a live viewing party where we're all watching along an event together and talking about it. Whatever it is you want to do, um, let's make this fun. Let's make this completely interactive. You know, please by all means check out the Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Russeltopia TV. Make sure you check out the YouTube page, uh, YouTube forward slash Russeltopia TV. The Tape Trader Guide to 90 Pro Wrestling on Facebook is facebook.com forward slash 90s Indie Pro Podcast. Um, don't forget WrestleTopia, my other business, the number one sponsor and only sponsor of this podcast. Um, but, you know, you can all make that change. Um, you know, on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the number one WrestleTopia. That's right, the number one WrestleTopia. Check it out on Facebook. It's got everything you could ever possibly want if you're a, a fan or collector of vintage or unusual pro wrestling items. Um, you know, you can always search me on, on Instagram, on Facebook, Tumblr. Um, you know, I just, I just sign up for wherever the fuck the newest, uh, social media app is and just create an account. So, you know, search me out, look me up. Um, I want to give a couple of shout outs real quick. I want to shout out to EJ Crop. Um, I want to shout out to Joe Sart. I want to do a shout out to um, Douglas Campbell. Um, you know, uh, all of you guys out there that are actively, you know, listening to the podcast, whether you're subscribing to the Podbean or not, if you're listening to it and enjoying it, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. I can't explain just how thankful I am. Um, by all means, you won't hurt my feelings with constructive criticism. Let me know. I will do my best to improve at, at all at all turns that I possibly can. So until next time, you know, um, hopefully uh, Bandana will be back next time and this will be bigger and better than it was this time. So hit that, that download, hit that subscribe, and tell a friend, tell a neighbor. 
let everybody know that you want more of this. Earlier we talked to Jumpin' Jeff Farmer. Let's go now to that interview. Folks, there's Jumpin' Jeff Farmer. Jeff, a while back, what a match you had with Motley. Yep. Probably the hardest match I ever had in my life. But I don't like it when things aren't my, going my way. Motley Cruz, you turn the tables on me. You turn the tables in a wrong way. You got me mad now. I've stood around. I've listened to everything you had to say. I've did everything necessary. But when you turn around and you backstab me one way or another and you treat, cheat me out of what's rightfully mine, that's when I get angry. Now I'm the one doing the challenging. I'm issuing a challenge to you, Motley Cruz. Get in the ring with me. This time, I'm going full force. Jumping Jeff Farmer. Now let's go to the ring. Mr. Lauer, and you probably all know that you can bring the heavy offense, but there are a lot of skeptics that think that perhaps you can't take it, that uh, you can't take the punishment that Diesel will give you tonight. How do you address those skeptics? Well, the skeptics and all the people that have a... Brady Boone and Scott Dorn. How you doing, Don? That was a hell of a finish. Yeah. Coco Samoa. It's one of the fastest energetic men I've ever seen in the ring today. The belts are on the line. What can I say? He's got one fall under, uh, going for him. We may see the belts change, hand here to, change hands here tonight. I, I really feel that, me and my new partner here. What we've got going, we feel, is one of the, one of the best combinations of tag teams I've ever been involved with. I feel this, my partner here, he's one of the fastest men, one of the most agile, energetic individuals I've ever been teamed with. Now, me and Brady are going to be going after the belts. Pendleton, Washington. We got, we got the title on the line, the belts are on the line all week. We got Pendleton, we got Yakima. We're going after the clan, we're going after Budadine, we're going after Mike Miller. We almost had him here tonight. The clan, Mike, uh... The clan jumped in there. They just blindsided us right from behind. It's not going to happen. By the time the week's over, we plan to have those belts right around our waist. Tell them, That's right, Skid. Uh, same goes for here. I couldn't have a better man on my quarter. He's, uh, he's big. He's powerful. That's exactly what someone like me needs to compliment myself. Let me tell you, there's a few things I don't understand. And one of them's where Rip Oliver can bring someone in like Buddha Dean, a flag-waving, flag-waving commie foreigner and have the belt. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Mike Miller, you're no better. You're supporting The only thing American about you is your name. And they make beer. Let me tell you, Miller, Buddha Dean, Rip Oliver, we've been beating the pants off you all over the Pacific Northwest. Everywhere we go, we've been putting your shoulders down one, two, three. And when you do happen to maybe come out on a fall, it's from cheating. Well, let me tell you, whether it be Pendleton, Yakima, White Swan, Medford, Salem, right back in Eugene, and right here Saturday, we're going to get you. All right. Thanks very much. Yes. Well said, Don. By the end of the week, me and this man here are going to have those belts. Whatever the other one is, we're going to have them. Okay. Brady Boone, Scott Doring, we're going back out to the ring now for our second fall of our main event. First fall. This is Square Garden, Monday night, November the 25th, 8 p.m. start. In the meantime, this Friday night, on a Union Day of Long Island at the Nassau Coliseum, 8 p.m. start, Hulk Hogan to meet Jesse, the body, Ventura, for the heavyweight title. Come on it if you would. Don Morocco, Mr. Fuji, gentlemen, on Friday night, out at the Nassau Coliseum, it is going to be the tandem of Ricky Steamboat and the Junkyard Dog, Mr. Fuji. Uh, so, <laughs> Steamboat sounds. you've been suffering, right? You've been making a fool of yourself on TV, right? On the hand of magnificent one, and you truly Mr. Fujisan. So now, to save the embarrassing, or save face, you being junkyard of your son. <laughs> How sweet it is, boy, son. You will pay more. All right, uh, Don Morocco, certainly you can add to the comments of Mr. Fujisan. We have a steamboat. See, what we have here is a steamboat who's looking for a friend. So what does the steamboat do? He goes out and finds a dog. Isn't this a wonderful little story for all you little boys and girls? Wonderful, wonderful, just wonderful. So when the steamboat finds the dog, 
dog sniffing all over the place, going all over the grounds, all over the place, and you know he's been there because he's messy and you step all over him. You have a steamboat and a dog. And you have Mr. Fuji and Magnificent Morocco, you see. And we don't leave things all over, do we? Mm -hmm. like you like the numbers, number? Yeah, 64. 64. Yeah. Don't get cute with me now. No, I'm not. Don't get cute with me. Because it's all numbers. It's all time. Time and numbers and space. 64, maybe 65, but maybe 46 in somebody else's eyes. And we're going to be in your face. Thank you, gentlemen. I can't thank you enough. Don Morocco and Mr. Fuji. Nassau, this Friday night. Fans, stay tuned. We're going to be right back. Night combat in a cage. Something you've never seen before. You're going to see the greatest collection of Smoky Mountain wrestlers. You got Rock and Roll Robert Gibson. You got the Nature Boy Buddy Landell. You have Tracy Smothers. You have Terry Gordy. You have Pat Tanaka. You have the Heavenly Bodies, Dr. Tom Pritchard, Gigolo Jimmy Delray, and you've got Bad Brad Armstrong all wrapped up together like you've never seen before. Tell them about it, Hoot. I tell you what, with a combination like that, hey, we can't lose. That's just our game. Right. Well, well, bam, bam. Yeah, you know, brother, hey, hey, you know, I've been in 10,560 of these cage matches, and I've won every dad gum one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. yeah, yeah. yeah. You got it, man. Hey, what we're talking about, tell them, bam, bam, you wasn't done, man. You hey, 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 you know, when I get to Louisville, you know, there's going to be some butt kick. And some names taken. You got it. Hey, what we're talking about here is we're talking about Bloody yeah, Sunday. Uh, we're talking about yeah, the night. Yeah. And we're talking about the thugs. T is for terrible. H yeah. is for hell. U is for ugly. And G is for jail. Because yeah. a thug can't spell. Yeah. That's what I think of the USWA. And that's what these outlaws think, man. Let me tell you something. Jerry, the queen lawler. Bill thinks he's a superstar, Dundee. And Tommy, wildflower, rich. And what is he? Dan Boar, Dan, Daisy, Doug Gilbert, whatever he calls it, rated G13, man. And Pat Tanaka is with us, too, man. He's the only one in the USWA. And Billy Jack, Billy Jack, you come out and interfere with my match, man. Or I won the Smoky Mountain Challenge against the USWA just a couple of weeks ago. And Pretty boy, prima donna, prime time. You want to stick your nose in the thugs' business when you're playing. You're just, that's just our game, man. We're the outlaws. We're the thugs. We know what it's all about. On the USWA, Smoky Mountain Wrestling is what's hot. USWA is not, and I hate Louisville, Kentucky. So tonight, we're taking the USWA out, the thugs.